The first paper is going to be Terry Bristol from Portland State University. And you can see the title here. Uh, this is Paul Romer's New Growth Economics of Paradigm Shift in Philosophy of the Law. I think I'll, I'll go ahead and try and use this with this people in the back there. Uh, okay, so uh, what is this all about? So it's going to be, hopefully it's theoretically, it's going to be uh, uh, free relevance to philosophy of technology. But the uh, main thing is Paul Romer just got the Nobel Prize, uh, 2018 Nobel Prize in economics, along with this uh, Nordhaus, who I'll speak about a little bit. So why did he get it, and what is it all about? That's the whole thing here. So what I want to suggest is that he actually, Romer solved the problem, OK? And uh, Romer, Romer solved the problem. And in solving the problem, he made a paradigm shift. I'm going to call it a meta-paradigm shift, because it's, it's post-scientific. He goes to, from uh, scientific economics to post-scientific economics in order to solve the problem. So what was the problem? The problem is growth. And it's a problem for scientific economics. So why is it a problem for scientific economics? And uh, so this is uh, Nature of Science 101. What is, what is a science? And how do you define a science? Well, it has about causal relationships. Same cause, same effect. Uh, uh, repeatability means if I have some scientific knowledge, I can, uh, I can repeat the experiment, the demonstration, uh, at different times, different places. Uh, I would say Galileo dropped the balls in Pisa in 16, whatever it was, and you can do it here now, uh, same experiment, more or less. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, invariant over time and space, time, space, invariant. And that's kind of these are, um, there's a uniformity and a symmetry to the function. You have functions and they're symmetric over time. And uh, one of the consequences of all those is conservation. And of course you see it in physics guys talk about all the time, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, so forth. Well, in, in uh, economics, it's, there's also conservation, which we'll look at. But, it, but the main thing is, is growth is a conf in conflict. So, it's important to understand that this, the problem, why growth is a problem, and you'll see, you'll see more, but that's kind of just want to emphasize that again. So, uh, a little bit more sophisticated. So, the original, uh, you know, science was just Newtonian stuff, and functions, and forth. But uh, in this era, in the uh, economics, uh, people in economics are, Turns out they're very sophisticated in terms of math and all the stuff they're using. So they're getting into dynamics and variational calculus because you're into all that stuff. These are really, they call it the modern movement. I mean, it's rocket science economics. So it's good news, bad news. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. But the idea is uh, you're into dynamics. And dynamics is like the whole idea is a pendulum. You, know, you got, you know, there's a potential and kinetic energy and they always, but anyway, energy is conserved. But it's just a little bit more sophisticated model. You have what we call steady state models. Now, and we know these geology, you know, the volcanoes going up, and wind and uh, uh, rain wearing down, and new volcanoes come up, and so forth. And biology, you know, static processes going up and down. And uh, so these are steady state models. And the main thing is that there's no, supposedly, in the ideal, no net change. Okay? So, which is conservation. Now, for economics, the, uh, uh, the dynamic model is uh, supply and demand, or consumption and production. And that's supposed to be in a steady state. You know, it's just a zero sum game, okay? Economics is zero sum game. And uh, that, that's, that's a colloquial way of saying the same thing. Uh, so, why is growth, or why was growth, a problem for scientific economics? And it isn't Romer that started this. And this has been, this has been an issue for a long time in economics. But I'm going to say is that the reason that it was a problem is because it violates conservation. Okay, because growth is actually net change, which we'll go into what is it really and so forth. Uh, and if that's true, then in order to understand and explain growth, you have to go to a post-scientific uh, concept of, uh, of economics. And that's what we're going to do. 
So, okay, so about 1800s, these are just empirical observations. Empirical observation is that, so I have to put this down for a sec. You have, um, if everything's applied to me and it always goes to equilibrium like this, but what started, they started noticing was that this, the equilibrium point kept going up, okay? And if everything's going towards equilibrium, then why is the equilibrium point going up, okay? So they have, uh, you know, for small things, there are fluctuations, you know, that's typical science stuff. So if there was a hurricane hit your economy, well, the equilibrium point would go down a little bit. Uh, you happen to have a good crop here, it goes up a little bit. These are fluctuations around that equilibrium point. Okay, so we have that, but what we call these things, like the weather, the geology, and so forth, influences their external factors, you know, the term exogenous factors. So they were things that would modify the where the equilibrium point was, but they were external, they were largely unpredictable, and they just didn't have anything to do with the real economic activity itself. But observation, for instance, in, in uh, 1850, a farmer uh, the production of a farmer per acre was about two bushels of corn per acre. By 1950, it was 200 bushels, okay. and there's a little bit of input, but not much. Okay, so early on, beginning of the 20th century, everybody's looking at this thing going on, and people kind of go, what is going on? I think I think the first one who, who said it, and he says, he, I modify here a little bit, uh, he says, it's, it's technology stupid, okay? These inventions, these new ideas, new ways of doing things, that's why, you know, you can plow, you can use fertilizer, agriculture growing up. There are all these different things you can do that make the production of that same land uh, much greater. So the main thing that I want to emphasize, though, is that because innovations are, by their very nature, not predictable, it is, uh, so they were treated as exogenous, just like the weather. And uh, one guy, uh, Solo, called them uh, manna from heaven. So they happen, but they're not the result of supply and demand. Those activities, production, consumption, do not produce innovations in the same way. Okay. So, uh, so in in uh, Solo's, Robert Solo had the, was the kind of mainstream scientific economics. You can't let go of it. And but he sees this growth thing going on. So classical growth. You have classical growth, which is why you put another uh, uh, field into production. Well, that's growth. You just add more. I used to say one more McDonald's, one more McDonald's. So you are adding, but those are you know very uh, uh, straightforward things. But then what they're measuring, however, they take all that into account. But what they're measuring is actually uh, much much greater. In other words, what's going on the actual production is much much greater than can be accounted for by land labor capital. So what so did, clever uh, mathematics guys, so he just adds another function to his growth model, to his classical growth model, it's, and it's called the exogenous technological input. So it's really just going to assume there's a constant input of these uh, innovations in the economy, and we'll just, you know, that's how we'll treat it. As, you know, as a function, and that's cool because it's, uh, it's science. It's not science. Uh, so, as, we get, as time goes on, the amount of growth that you had to attribute to this external technological factor in the set, I don't know the set is like eighty-five percent of the actual growth. Like fifteen percent is land labor and stuff, and eighty-five percent is something else. Well, what is it? What is it? External? Whatever. Where did it come from? As he uses, uh, Solo uses the term manna, manna from heaven. So I don't know what. I don't know the causes, I don't know the kind of like, there it is. So real quick, what is growth? So uh, this is the problem. I mean, because well, what's going up? We, what are we measuring? And you can make some simple ones, but it's really, not the simple ones that work too well. But so this guy, Nordhaus, who actually shares the Nobel Prize in 2018 with uh, Romer, uh, has this really neat study. And he studies, he starts looking at light, production of light. He 
how much work does a person have to do in order to produce, he takes just as a standard, a thousand lumens of light. Okay, he tries to go back to you know prehistoric times, you know, chopping wood and putting it together. He figured out for a, a prehistoric person it was like 56 hours. And then he goes up through the different technologies, uh, uh, candles, uh, oil lamps. I mean, there's a whole series of things that you can track the technologies. And for each one of those, the amount of work that a person has to put in in order to do a thousand moons goes down, 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 down. And as you go up this thing recently, of course, you got incandescent bulbs, and you've got fluorescence, and you've got LEDs. I mean, the amount of time for uh, an hour of my work or the average worker in the United States to uh, produce a thousand lumens of light is in the hundreds of a second. Okay. Now, what, what um, Nordhaus comes out on this, and it's quite good, because a lot of people, other people want to measure, well, it's the GDP, and of course, the this is going up. And he says, no, no, those, those quantitative measures are missing something. Okay, and I used to call this, and I fell into this, I, I said, well, we're getting more and more efficient, right? <laughs> that assumes that you're doing the same thing. Okay, but if these innovations are disruptive in a qualitative sense, they change what the economy is doing. So the economy is qualitatively restructuring every time you have an innovation. It's a new economy in some sense. This is why it doesn't fit into the scientific model, because it's like, it's a qualitative development. It's not a, you can't reduce it to a quantitative development. Uh, okay, so in, in Nordhaus, he introduced this idea of well-being, which is quite nice, which is why someone said, why we don't have, we haven't had more uh, uh, Marxist revolutions. Because even though people are poor and they're getting less and less and less and they're creating inequality, they're a whole lot better off than they were. And we're thinking about down lines, though, in Africa, you, you can have now, Solar-powered cell phones. Okay, for some guy in Africa, is, I mean that's like amazing. So, but it's not going to come out in terms of the uh, numbers. So, injured Paul Lomer. So he works on this for quite a while, his PhD thesis and stuff. In uh, '86 and in 1990, he publishes this paper, now famous, called "Endogenous Technological Change." And all the technological change from before was, of course, exogenous, right? And so on. So he just says, "No, endogenous." Well, what's he doing? Okay, so what he's, this is what I call meta paradigm shift. He's shifting out of science. This is not, this is like, not gonna, this is not gonna be explained within a scientific model because it's violated science. So he says, okay, you know, ideas and the production of ideas are actually an internal process to an economy. Now what's happening here is really gonna change the concept of what economic activity is. Okay, and he's gonna change the concept of the economic actor. So I, I, there's a whole hand thing they do, like, so everything's going, uh, what Homer does is this, so. Uh, standard economics is, everything's going this way. Homer says, no, 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 that's not what's going on. This is what's going on, okay? So what he's saying is, is that normal economies are net productive. They, normal, they normally grow, they normally produce wealth, okay? And, and, uh, and, he, and you know, and, and we learn by doing is one of these questions. That comes from Errol initially. It's a very pragmatic sort of concept, learning by doing. This is not like we're deriving it from some theory. You know, we get out there and muck around with something, and we learn how to do it, and then we do it some more, we learn how to do it better. And that's more or less the process that Romer's focusing on. And the main, one of his main things, he focuses on why ideas are different from land, labor, and, and uh, capital because they're what he calls non-rivals. Like if I have a cup of coffee, you drink it or I drink it, it's consumed, okay? Ideas are not like that. Plow your field. Let's look over my name. God, he plowed his field in his production. An idea like plowing your field is an idea that's shareable and it does not decrease, uh, in, it's not consumed, okay? So that's what you mean by non-rivals, okay? It's, like it's not you have it or I have it or I have it. No, ideas are non-rivals. And largely non-excludable. This is debatable a little bit because non-excludable uh, would mean that they're easily shared. But we, of course, try and have partial excludability with patents and copyright and all that sort of stuff for a period of time. Uh, so one of the things he does then he makes a hard distinction between ideas and things. Okay, bits and what is it? Bits and atoms. Okay. So he's saying that the two things, this quantitative materialist idea of growth 
uh, is, you know, like, okay, how much land you got? You know, what's, you talk about carrying capacity. What's the carrying capacity of the Earth per population? And of course, this is the kind of dialogue that we've heard from the Limits of Growth people, the Club of Rome, all that sort of stuff. And growth is based on those, those fundamentals. So, the most growth is we're measuring is not based on those, on the, how much land or water, air, gold, silk you have. It's about what you do with it. Okay. Innovation, designs, blueprints. So it's two, two examples that I like. One is uh, the Starbucks coffee deal. So he says, oh, well, Starbucks used to have three, they always sell three sizes of cups. He said three sizes of lids. And then somebody figured out, well, what if we just change the geometry of the cups a little bit? You can have one side, one lid. So that, you know, it's not rocket science. Somebody just figured it out, just change the geometry a little bit. So, so the supply chain for Starbucks is simplified. You only need one type of lid. They're more efficient, they're better, okay? So that's one example. The other example, is Ramsey says, uh, just a few years ago, he said, 10 years ago, I had to, I had to spend a hundred, a hundred dollars for a gigabyte, to add a gigabyte of RAM to my computer. He said, now I can get a gigabyte of RAM for 10 bucks. And then he says, I didn't do anything. The point is, if somebody in his ecosphere, so to speak, solved the problem, came up with a new way to make chips cheaper, and he benefits, okay? So, his big, you know, this, God, hey, it's in my interest that other people in my ecosphere succeed. I'm not so much in competition with them. I want them to you know, come up with some good ideas. You know? Come up with something good. Uh, so anyway, so that's that's the basic. Uh, I have the title of the book I mean, I'm working on: New Growth Economics, New Growth Politics, New Growth Morality. You can see the morality of this. Say, it's in my interest that others succeed. When I first thought about this, this sort of sounds like the golden rule or something, doesn't it? Okay, so uh, characteristics here. Uh, so one thing is, is the growth of ideas is cumulative, okay? And as it's cumulative, it also tends to accelerate. So Romer is, uh, has, has been characterized as the first post-Malthusian economist, post-scarcity economist. And uh, so what he's saying is that normal functioning economy actually overproduces uh, and uh, uh, produces abundance, more than what we consume by the people in there, okay? So, and what is it, in his current criteria, uh, Nordhaus said, you know, well-being, uh, all uses increasing capacity to perform work. So it's sort of like saying, okay, so my hour, what I can buy with my hour of work is increased tremendously, that's one measure. And one way to express that is to say, with the norm, my normal working day, I have increasing capacity to perform work, increasing capacity to do things. I have more freedom, more ability, I can do more things, I can explore, I can go to the moon, whatever. Uh, okay, so. Uh, so, real quick, so this is the, uh, he's very much against these guys, the, you know, Paul Ehrlich at Stanford, you know, in 65, or where was it, we're all going to starve to death at the time of our five because of population growth, so forth. So, Romer's uh, post-scarcity push from Malthusian. What I have to say is that no one on the planet Earth has ever starved to death for lack of food on the planet Earth. Now, there's distribution problems in politics. But, okay, so the idea is that, that again, that the, if there's a production of abundance. Uh, Schumpeter had an expression, I think I might have it in here. Well, this is a good book if you want. Uh, Ramiz Nam has this book called Infinite, Res Infinite Resource, The Power of Ideas on a Finite Planet. The idea is, no, it's not, sure the planet's finite, but that doesn't limit our growth, okay? And it's ideas that do the hard work. Uh, real quick here, so a couple of characteristics of post-scientific uh, economics. One is it's a systems framework. Uh, um, a friend of mine at UCLA, he said, he said, in my 75 years, he said, uh, world population has doubled, so economic output has increased eightfold. Eightfold. Okay, this is now the new normal expectation. Okay, so uh, so any and when you put it, any given population, normally functioning economy produces way more than they can possibly consume. And and it's not it's not that producing more TV sets or more whatever. It's, they're producing more opportunity, and opportunity is cumulative. 
Okay, uh, Schumpeter called it uh, cumulative causation. Okay. Uh, I think one example of this is that guy, uh, Steve Johnson has this uh, program, this book in the PBS series called uh, How We Got to Now. And it's about, um, he has all these examples. And one of them is clear glass. Uh, the family or the guy who, who figured out how to make the clear glass is, is in Florence. He's going to go back, the family's still there. And, and uh, think of all the things that have come from clear glass. I mean, windows, and fiber optic, I mean, all this stuff. These are all things that, that, and so technology tends to accumulate and build on itself, and that's one of the main reasons that there's this acceleration. Also, growth of knowledge is emergent. Okay, it's theory of knowledge comes out of Knowledge, growth of knowledge is emergent. It is not convergent. Uh, and one of these, this is changing my type around it. Uh, one way to put that, that, that uh, an advance opens new types of questions and new opportunities for exploration. Uh, the other characteristic of, uh, of post is, is that it's a participant. So, just the system thing. So, as, as Romer saying, hey, somebody in my ecosphere uh, solved the problem. Well, I'm inside the ecosphere now. Okay, and Dewey makes a really nice uh, distinction between a spectator representation of inquiry and a participant representation of inquiry. That's exactly what uh, Romer's gone to. So he's a participant. So as some of the question changes, the question is not how does the world, objective world out there work as if I wasn't part of it, which is the ideal of the scientific model. Uh, no, I'm inside it. And so what I want to know is how to do things in the world. I want to know how the world works, how things are generated, and how I can influence that. But that's the, the context of inquiry, that's the context of, of, uh, of knowledge. Um, so, and one of the things that's important that I'm going to get into is that it's important that post-scientific framework subsumes and supersedes uh, the scientific framework, which means that uh, subsume means it can explain everything that the sciences explain uh, as ideals, usually in special cases, and but it understands them in a new way, which is the sense that the question, the actual question has changed. Uh, who's wrong button here? Uh, so that's just so again, that in the participant thing, ideas and knowledge are inside uh, the economy. We're inside the economy. Everyone's an economist. Uh, we're all doing it. There's this funny thing about if you're doing scientific economics, well, the scientific, well, it's deterministic. So what am I predicting what's going to happen? Well, wait a minute, can I influence it? Is it like, <laughs> which way am I going there? So when you're a participant, then Economics makes sense. It's what I call self-referentially coherent. Uh, science is not. Uh, also, the, the actor, the economic actor, is not perfectly informed, which is one of the consequences of scientific. Everybody has perfect information, perfect access to resources. Nonsense. Uh, and I call it an existential uh, agency. So here I am, instantiated in the world. I have the ability to act, but I don't have any script not to do. So I explore, I discover. And uh, Romer very explicitly embraces uncertainty. He said, ah, what's uncertain? Discovery. So learning itself, the process of learning and so forth, is, is uh, there's, a, there's an old thing about children don't need a theory of questions in order to ask questions any more than uh, 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 fish need uh, theory of hydrodynamics to swim. Anyway, this is a good book by this guy. This is, you know, I'm going to jump. Uh, an idea of, Participant is also is really an engineer and, and designing systems. This is something at Harvard Business Review. I'm sure you guys all read this. That was just design thinking. What's happened is it's not just designing the irrigation of my fields, designing my house, designing my neighborhood, designing my city, designing my uh, uh, how I'm going to design my economy. I'm going to patents and tariffs. How am I going to design my, my uh, 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 political system? Well, at that point, you're Plato's Republic. Okay, your Constitution is an, is an experimental design document. Now, how am I going to design my business? How am I going to design my life? So, uh, so the only thing I want to get into here a little bit, it, it, it's more radical. Than it. So, <coughs> how does it, so post-scientific, I'm going to call you post-scientific. The other post-scientific framework that came up in the 20th century is quantum theory, okay? And quantum theory, uh, uh, 
some of the, the stuff I don't think they need. But anyway, so, so quantum theory uh, has, has this uh, uh, Newtonian mechanics and Maxwellian mechanics are ideals. Okay? There is, neither one of them is, is valid, totally, because everything actually happens in, in, this, in between. So like right, every, every measurement, everything you do, has an element of the particle, an element of the... So Romer pulls out, there are actually two economic sciences. If you look at the history of economics in the century, one has to do with perfect competition, the other one is perfect cooperation. Okay, it's from uh, Milton Friedman versus, versus uh, Keynes. And he plays it up and he openly says, here's the, trick, here's the deal. There's no, so are you going to choose? You want to have more competition? You want to have more cooperation? What do you do? And, and uh, how are you going to make that decision? The main point is there's no analytic uh, solution to that. Okay? There's no way to sit down and calculate that out. So what do you do? Well, how do I decide? So here's where he says, well, it's a social decision. Okay? And uh, I like uh, uh, this guy, Bill McDonough. He says, when you come up with that, you can't, can't decide to check in with your values. So ultimately, this, this is about uh, uh, the, the middle ground is that you're always making your decisions between these ideals, really. And all real systems in the world are, I call middle ground, like a so go to soccer game. Are you, are you watching competition or cooperation? Well, both, okay? And this guy, Oakshot, at LSE, points out, he says, all real economics, all real societies have a competitive aspect and a cooperative aspect. So how do you decide? Well, in Roman's point, in post scientific economics, you're not going to calculate the answer. Okay? You're not going to, you know, calculation. There's some, you know, calculations are good, you're not throwing them out. But the ultimate context of what you're doing is one in which you have to make these decisions, and those decisions are ultimately value decisions. Uh, Dewey calls it, uh, so what are we doing when we're evolving in the world? He says, uh, called the construction of the good. I have another talk earlier about that it's, uh, that it's all about morality, it's moral realism. And uh, it's all about you know, the middle way and uh, the middle way and all that. So that's enough. Okay? Did I run over? Thank you.